Welcome everybody to another Voice of Nick show. We're doing an exciting uh, thing this time. We're starting on my next audiobook. Uh, it, it's been in production a little while, but this is the first time we're streaming it. So uh, I'm pretty excited to share it with you guys. The, uh, <clears throat> the project is a, a Swedish epic poem called Anjara, which is a really incredible story from the 50s by Harry Martinson. Uh, I am uh, was very surprised that this uh, story, which is like just, <laughs> I, I I was so impressed by the story, but I was surprised to find that the story actually does not. Uh, it's out of print. Like you can't you, you can't get it anywhere. It's really hard to get um, your hands on the text at all. There's kind of like a like a like a. Amazon does those kind of like royalty free versions from like, you know, s sort of archives or whatever. And, uh, you know, it's it's not like an official printing or anything. And I, I was super surprised by that. So anyway, I, I'm putting out my own edition of the book um, with I'm not sure if it'll have the same level of illustrations that we did for Post Homerica when we put that one out or if we're just going to be illustrating cover art and stuff like that. Uh, but I am also making my own audiobook of it, which, to my knowledge, has never existed before in English. And uh, we're we're sort of, it's really exciting for me because we're kind of bringing this to the U.S. Um, you know, for people to to experience. So the uh, translation for this, for anybody who's aware of the translations, there's kind of two major ones. We're doing the Hugh McDermott, Elspeth Harley Schubert version, uh, which. From what I've read of, you know, I've only read this one in full, but uh, I, I preferred this one uh, greatly to the other translation. Uh, <laughs> no, uh, no offense to the uh, the the other translators, but uh, yeah. So I, I'm really excited for this. I've already recorded the entire narration of the book, um, and I'm currently in the editing process. I figure let's let's jump into the the streaming portion of it. So just like with Post America, these uh, will be released. They're already released. This is live. We're recording this live. But these are uh, also going to be included uh, in the book itself. Uh, there will be a link to like a playlist of all these videos for anybody who's interested in the kind of like a you know production process of a book. You know, I'm I'm out here self self publishing this stuff. Um, you know, self illustrating, self narrating, self. Uh, copy editing, self, uh, you know, writing of any necessary supplementary materials. It's sort of a one-man show here. And uh, for anybody else who is interested in making their own book or audiobook or illustrations or whatever, hopefully this will be useful and interesting to you guys. Or, or just yeah, if you're if you liked the book or liked the narration, maybe it's interesting as well to see how it got made. Uh, and of course, if you're watching this before the book is out, like uh, anybody who's watching live, I hope you'll find it interesting as well. Hopefully it'll be a bit of a preview of what you can get. So uh, we're currently working here on, this is a uh, song 60 of the book. There's 103 songs or, you know, sort of chapters of the story. So um, we're pretty far into it, you know, story-wise here. Of course, you'll, you know, it's a bit of a spoiler warning for anybody who's uh, interested in, in reading the story for themselves, but hopefully, uh, you know, it won't, won't uh, detract from the experience. Oh, welcome Takajin to the show. Komawa. Hi. Atarashi audio book o tsukutte mas. Totemo tanoshimi ni shite mas. Eto, as ECW TV, a new audio book. Yeah, I'm pretty pumped. It, this is a. Uh, 
Post America was our last self-published uh, and self-illustrated, you know, book and audio book that we did, and we did that live on stream. Uh, and then I put out uh, a narration of another book, uh, another author's uh, book, which was not live broadcast because that was, you know, someone's an author's uh, a, a modern author's work that I was uh, creating the audio book for. So this is the first time since Post America that we're back uh, live streaming this stuff. So I'm pretty pumped for that. So we're going to jump back in here and work on the audio editing process. The really quick log line of Aniara for anybody who's interested, um, it's about, this was written in the 50s, um, and it's kind of like a uh, positing on, on space travel and psychology of space travel and stuff like that. And uh, the idea is that these people get on a, a sort of like, almost like a ferry from Earth to uh, uh, another planet. And they, so it's like, it's not like a spaceship with like all the kind of uh, uh, fixings that a regular spaceship would have. So it's it's really only supposed to be able to go from here to there and there to here and A to B and B to A, like not really have that many features, uh, like a cruise ship kind of thing. And so they get on the thing and an asteroid throws them out of whack and they end up hurtling without the ability to really do any advanced uh maneuvers to get back, they, they're they hurtling away from their destination and have to come to terms with the idea that they're never, mathematically speaking, they'll never be able to, with the fuel and the resources they have, they'll never be able to get back uh, to their destination or back to Earth. So they kind of have to, it, it's the story of these people kind of consistently over the years <laughs> um, having to learn to live with you know, just living in, in this spaceship. Uh, and it, in my opinion, it's really extraordinary. And I, I tried to, my best to do justice to the story. So let's keep going. Oh, Takajin saying, I see it was a new project today. I thought you were talking about Death Stranding too. Ah, その、え、シュディオでした。え、そしてその、え、新しいゲームはアナウンスでした。とてもびっくりしました。完璧のタイミングですね。ですけど、はいはい、これは僕の新しいオーディオブックプロジェクトだね。Yeah, the Stranding 2 we finished Death Stranding 1 yesterday and the the new one got announced yesterday. <laughs> That's pretty impressive cuz our Death Stranding playthrough was like 140 hours, so the odds of it being finished on the exact day the new one got announced was like that was like fate. So let's jump in here. The heavy cap spread out across the earth, a <clears throat> circumpolar covering. So great countries were clad in ice many kilometers thick. Not only Arctic snow came moving down, the hexagons of frozen convolutions, but cosmic snow too from the nebulosa, turning winters into eons. An icy crust concealed the lands of Europe, which hidden under huge sheets of ice, were bedded down for 16,000 years, deprived of every ray of sunshine. And people in these countries carried their technical skills as far south as possible, making some resistance for a while, then sank, frozen, into a barbarous coma. So through a period of 12,000 years, man was a savage, who, armed with fragmentary memories of technology, wanted to see the sun return again, to kindle the woods of nature. The botch line is supposed to say, waited to see the sun return again. How do we do this? Is it this? So this chapter here, uh, again, this is about halfway into the book. And a as you keep going, at first, it seems like it's just a... Uh, like a trip, you know, like a like a cruise ship type of thing where they're going from Earth to, I think they're going to Mars it, uh, in the story. It's been a little while since I recorded the the VO and since I last read the book, but uh, yeah, that's how it goes when you do the production stuff. You you, you separate the the reading from the from the editing. But uh, at first, it just seems like it's sort of a trip for the sake of a trip. But uh, as you keep going, you kind of realize that they actually left the Earth because the Earth is destroyed by a nuclear war and, uh, you know, like radiation and stuff. So it's sort of out of necessity. And as you keep going through the story, you also hear all these 
horrific stories about what happened to the earth. Uh, and this is about actually sort of like a second ice age that occurred uh, on in this sort of sci-fi history of the earth, um, you know, before the events of the story. So through a period of 12,000 years, man was a savage who armed with fragmentary memories of technology, wanted to see the sun return again, to kindle the woods of nature and realms of culture. Succeeding generations turned the wheels and spun the threads in prim- Succeeding generations nature and realms of culture. Succeeding generations turned the wheels and spun the threads in primitive workshop, and spun the threads in and spun the threads in primitive workshops where they were re-educated for hard living and accustomed to ice age conditions. The nebula of coal to ice age conditions. The nebula of cold now passed the sun, yet to humans in pre goldundic days it seemed for fifteen centuries like a morning veil, a titanic clock now past the sun, yet to humans in pre goldundic days it seemed for fifteen centuries like a morning veil, a titanic cloth of coal-black satin, which every evening rolled across the heaven, darkening the galaxies with its will, darkening the galaxies with its titanic clothes with its in time. seemed for fifteen centuries like a morning veil, a titanic cloth of coal-black satin, which every evening rolled across the heaven, darkening the galaxies with its widow's weeds. In time this dark cloth passed further off, and being by passed further off, and being passed, f- passed, passed further off, this dark cloth passed further off, and being by cosmic st- mm, don't love that cut. Passed for, for passed for. Cloth passed further off. Mm. Might be a re-record situation. And this dark cloth passed further off. No, that works. In time, this dark cloth passed further off, and being by cosmic standards small, it lost as it grew more remote. It lost as and being by cosmic standards small, it lost as it grew more remote its first resemblance to a morning veil, its first resemblance to a morning veil, and hardly yeah, lost as it grew more remote its first resemblance to a morning veil, and hardly more than eleven thousand years after the centuries when eleven thousand years eleven thousand years after. Hardly more than eleven thousand years after the centuries when the sun left Golmos and continued on its way to renewed glory, this somber. So the story is uh, in itself very melancholic and very uh, downbeat. It's may- maybe one of the most depressing stories I've ever read. So I r- really tried to capture that, and I I did sort of like almost like a method acting type thing. I don't know you'd really call it that, but like uh, in order to capture the sort of like extreme weariness of the story, because even the moments of happiness are under this kind of like blanket of melancholy. Uh, I actually intentionally only ever recorded the story when I had been, I stayed up for like 24 hours and then recorded it um, so that the narration would have this kind of like cracked voice sound. <laughs> Uh, which I, I think it turned out pretty well. And hardly more than 11,000 years after the centuries when the sun left Golmos and continued on its way to renewed glory, this somber renewed glory, its way to renewed glory, this somber patch had almost disappeared from the center of a heaven refreshed. By then the ice had melted, and new races tasted the blessing of clear spring. New races tasted the blessing of clear springs in Gaunt. Tasted the blessing of races tasted the blessing. This 
I said, tasted the blessing of, and new races tasted the blessing of clear springs in Gond. So time after clip is two seconds. Springs in Gond. I'm not sure if the audiobook itself is going to have 103 individual chapters or if we're going to combine them. So it's like one chapter is called like chapters one through 10 or something. Because 103 chapters is kind of a lot. And also Audible gets pretty wonky when you have like short chapters. It, it's kind of like loudness detection goes crazy and then it, it, uh, it doesn't know how to, it keeps asking you to raise the volume. And it, sometimes it can get really weird. Okay, so this was number 60. 61. Oh, well, I guessed it exact. <laughs> ZCW saying, talk about a high-risk trip. Yeah. Well, it's it's one of those things, you know, where, like, you never really think about it. But, like, you know, if you take certain kinds of trips that you take, if something goes wrong, it's like imagine that you were driving cross-country, you know, and then in the middle of the desert you got stranded. It's like it's not really a high risk trip, but the circumstances made it uh, high risk once the the suitable amount of factors went wrong. Because um, like a car is very well equipped to get across the desert, and it, you know, assuming that you have enough gas and you have this and that, and you think that you're prepared, uh, but then like some kind of thing goes wrong with your engine and you're stranded in the desert it could still cause disaster. And that's basically what it is. It's not like they were doing anything risky. It's one of those things where there's been like, you know, hundreds of other trips like this that worked fine. Two sorts of ray. 61. Screen. Zero point eight. It's the time before clips. I have like a like a master sheet of like how long is it between the before the clip starts how long is it before the between the title of the chapter and the first word and stuff like that i like to standardize those so yeah hang tight for one second loading uh-oh uh-oh oh god why'd you have to do that oh jesus they came over quick. Woo! Stop doing zombie stuff, zombies. Foot. Here we go. Oh god, I hear breathing again. I think we always hear breathing when it's near a secret area, one of the caches. Oh! What? What even happened? I got hit by a piece of wood. That is definitely the least threatening thing that has attacked us so far in this game. Damn you, Alan Wake! How many rocket launchers did they buy? All right, we're back. So we... This is clip number 0828. Good. Until the release date, enjoy the audiobook. Sixty-one. I invented with the utmost difficulty a screen composed a screen composed of two did with the utmost difficulty a screen composed of two sorts of rays and found a way of hanging this and found a way of and found a and found a screen composed of two sorts of rays and found a way of hanging this as it were out in space and found a way of hanging this as it were out in space and found sorts of rays and found a way of hanging this as it were out in space some miles from the Goldunda, and towards this space screen I could then send a third sort of ray, which transmitted pictures. I could then send a third sort of ray, which transmitted pictures. 
In this way I contrive to establish the illusion of a wall in sp- in this way I contrive to establish the illusion of a wall in space, a kind of frieze stretched out there and made up of pictures of forests and moonlit lakes, mountains and cities. Sometimes I introduced a mighty army of people carrying banners of victory, all to make a seeming wall which could shut out the intolerable void. Later I built up yet another wall, this time on another side, and between these two resplendent walls... Yeah, the interesting thing about the story is that the sort of like the void of space, it's almost like a, a Lovecraftian sort of horror where just like the, the general concept of the blackness of space is so horrifying to the people in the story as it continues going forward, which is a really horrible it, uh, thought, you know, the idea, like being a marooned ship in the middle of the ocean, like it's just ocean, there's no, never, the landscape never changes. And in space, everything's so far away that like nothing ever even moves. It's just one static thing that look you see out the window all the time. There's no day, no night. It's like, it's really interesting psychological study. Which could shut out the intolerable void. Later, I built up yet another wall, this time on another side. And between these two resplendent walls of dense illusion, our spaceship glided well screened from the immense and gaping gorges, which could no longer stare in at us, as they'd done for the last nine years, stinging us, as they'd done for the last, which could no longer stare in at us. I don't know if this is going to work. Which could no longer stare in at us, as they'd done gaping gorges, which could no longer stare in at us, as they'd done for the last nine uh, If we add a little bit of room tone which could no longer stare in at us as they'd done for the last nine years stinging us like lances pricking us like needles but even such but even such tapestries of fantasy like needles but even such tapestries of fantasy need the support of some human will at least the contribution of some secret dreams from those who can only Secret dreams from some secret dream of some secret dreams contribution of some secret dreams from those who only crave but never give us anything but emptiness, a void which must be constantly fi- from those who co- secret dreams from those who only crave but never give us only crave from those who only who only mm. Here, dreams from those who only crave secret dreams from those who only crave but never give us anything but emptiness, a void which must be constantly filled and empty. Wait, uh, I guess that makes sense. Eve, but never give us anything but emptiness, a void which must be constantly filled and embellished. And now this emptiness turned. The story um, is also uh, written in the form of epic prose, uh, which the term epic has taken on its own meaning in the modern age. But epic poetry is a particular style of poetry, um, which, you know, in the Homeric tradition, things like that, um, you know, it, it's a it's a certain format. Uh, and it's really interesting that this is like a somewhat modern you know, it is a modern story that is written in epic prose, um, which sort of links it to our previous project because post Homerica, which was written, you know, 2000 years before this story we're working on now, uh, post Homerica was also epic poetry, uh, in sort of that same style. So, um, totally different subject matter, but there is kind of like a linking factor, I guess. Even such tapestries of fantasy need the support of some human will, at least. The contribution of some secret dreams from those who only crave but never give us. Anything but emptiness. A void which must be constantly filled and embellished. And now this emptiness turned against me, pursuing me to dark corners of the ship, threatening my life when I could not explain at once why emptiness remained. 
I saw then. I cannot explain at once why emptiness remained. I saw then how things are and how they were. No one can hide his inner emptiness. Mima had been smashed against the waves of time, like Humpty Dumpty on his famous wall. No one could mend poor Humpty Dumpty then. Still less have I any chance of mending you. Still less have I any chance of mending you. I any chance of mending you. That was pretty good. Your, your emptiness is terrifying indeed. Your emptiness. Your emptiness is terrifying indeed. Yeah, so you can see there's that kind of rawness of the voice that I was going for, uh, which is why I sleep deprived myself in order to, to do it. It's the waves of time, like Humpty Dumpty on his famous wall. No one could mend poor Humpty Dumpty then. Still less have I any chance of mending you. Your emptiness is terrifying indeed. Chance of mending you. Your emptiness is terrifying indeed. I kept on... I keep on conjuring, but at the bottom... is terrifying indeed. I keep on conjuring, but at the bottom the effort is hardly worth the trouble. But you contribute nothing of your souls, and so the pictures faded clean away. But you, but you contribute nothing of your souls, and so the pictures faded clean away. But you contribute nothing of your souls, and so the pictures faded clean away. And so the pictures faded clean away. And so the pictures faded clean away. I like this one the best. Oop. Oh yeah, that's my shortcut there. I created a, since the previous audiobook, I've uh, built like a whole new set of shortcuts in Audition that I'm pretty proud of. It's almost like uh, the control scheme of a first person shooter. Um, which I consider to be a very efficient uh, control scheme. Uh, on a PC, you're using WSD, spacebar, shift, you know, control, only the left side of the keyboard. Uh, but on Audition, by default, your hand needs to go all the way, all around. You know, JKL is stuff, I and O for in and out. Uh, copy paste is on the left, it's control C, control V, you know, undo, redo, control Z. Uh, so basically I remapped everything to be WASD, you know, C, E, Q, only the left side of the keyboard. So my hand never has to move, which doesn't make a lot of difference if you're only working on something short, but an audiobook, you know, the last audiobook I did was 16 hours long and every hour typically takes roughly like eight hours to, to make. So when you extrapolate that over time, uh, these kinds of like small changes really make a big time difference. Um, I, I was pretty proud of uh, uh, coming up with this, and it just worked really well for me. I keep on conjuring, but at the bottom, the effort is hardly worth the trouble. But you, the effort is hardly worth the trouble. But you, but you control. Oh, there we go. Yeah. But at the bottom, the effort is hardly worth the trouble. But you can... I feel like this wants an even longer pause. I keep on conjuring. But at the bottom, the effort is hardly worth the trouble. But you contribute nothing of your souls. And so the pictures faded clean away. There's another major story element uh, in this. Clean away. Which is... Uh, also a really interesting sci-fi concept this book is full of interesting sci-fi concepts it's so impressive but like 61 the uh the on the ship there's kind of like a it's like a like a um leisure activity it was this thing called the mima which is like a um it, it's 
not like a hologram generator. It's kind of unspecified like what it actually is, but it's some kind of sensory experience, like a 4D experience that pulls in signals from outer space and will show you a random scene from another world. Um, and so everybody goes to this thing in order to be like, you know, just have a, you know, like watching a movie, basically. It's just like a thing to do. But then once the ship goes off course, it becomes like a way of life. And then when the Mima is damaged and people can't use the Mima, it becomes like a religious symbol and people pray to it and, and beg it to come back. You know, it, it, it's like a really interesting, uh, again, like psychological study. We turn the 62. We turn the wheel of routine. We turn the wheel of routine. We turn the wheel of routine. I lecture space. Yeah, I like the first take better. A lot of times the first take is the best. Let's double check the timings. Yeah, that's correct. Um, there's an excellent movie adaptation of Anyara, which I didn't really, you know, I didn't want to be like copying their stuff or anything. So I, I have seen it, but I, I didn't like reference it for anything I'm doing on this project. But uh, the it's a really good movie. You, you guys can check it out. Um, I think it's on Hulu. 62. We turn the wheel of routine. I lecture space cadets on the science of the Gopta. Through the observation tower, suns peer in at us. They seem motionless, though we know that with thunderous roar they sway and rotate in everlasting night on pyres of Rentgen light. Everlasting night on pyres of Rentgen light. Yeah, it was a moment where I had to check my... I always make a pronunciation guide uh, for myself, and I had to check, like, did I pronounce Rentgen correctly? Peer in at us. They seem motionless, though we know that with thunderous roar they sway and rotate in everlasting night on pyres of Rentgen light. And while in my mind's ear I... ...lasting night on pyres of Rentgen light. And while in my mind's ear I hear them sound like terrible war drums in the long battle, like war drums, like terrible war drums in the long battle, I hear them sound like terrible, like terrible my mind's ear I hear them sound like terrible war drums in the long battle light wages against darkness without end. I hear my own voice making feeble sounds in answer to my question on the Gopta of the Gopta. On the Gopta. Okay, good. We got it right the first time. Yeah, this story also um it uses a kind of interesting a lot of sci-fi stories create their own like techno babble, uh, but this one is kind of closer to like, like a lot of sci-fi stories use techno babble, but they'll explain it. Um, and this one's kind of closer to like for anybody who's read like William Gibson, like Neuromancer or something, where it, it's like a world that's like kind of there's a certain layer to it that's just totally incomprehensible to like that's sort of like our era of reader you know it's like almost written for people of a different of a future age that has not happened yet so it's like oh of course you know what the gopta is or whatever you know what the you know whatever like all these different words that he uses in the story uh the same as in 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 neuromancer uh which you know came 30 years after this this was written or they sway and rotate in everlasting night on pyres of Rentgen light and while in my mind's ear I hear them sound like terrible war drums in the long battle light wages against darkness without end, I hear my own voice making feeble sounds in answer to my question on the Gopta. Only by revaluation of the new era and new extensions of the tensor calculus was it possible to find a means of discovering the split-up symmetry which, through the formula of five divided by three, was simplified and turned to real advantage in every tour made by the government. New era and new extensions of the tensor calculus, was it possible to find a means of discovering the split-up symmetry which, through the formula of five divided by three, was simplified and turned to real advantage in every tour made by the Gopta chariot? And then the space... 
every tour made by the Gopta chariot. And then the space cadets got up to go in perfect line into the hall, where the next teacher, worthy and placid, where the next teacher, and into the hall, where the next teacher, worthy and placid, where the next teacher, into the hall, where the next teacher, worthy and placid Giles, speaks to them about Goldunda buildings. So like this, for example, uh, it's a, this is a part about how the main character is like a sort of a scientist who is also actively trying to help repair the Mima unit. That's kind of his main job, but also uh, to, you know, try and figure out how to either get them back, which uh, feels like an uphill battle for everybody, but also even just to create like kind of livable circumstances on this uh, maroon spaceship. And so this is a moment where he's just like teaching students, you know, because they literally just have to create a, a life there. So they're they're like educating people in a school that they created and stuff. And uh, kind of like the drudgery of the day. Like I usually you don't want to make in an audiobook narration, you don't want to communicate sort of like a like a boredom. But there's certain chapters in this book where like I feel like the text demands that where you you know, where he sighs, like, and then I gave the students to the other, you know, teacher to, to talk to them. Like, he's just so bored with his, what's going on. And then some other horrible thing will happen and, and the story will kick back into gear. Uh, I had a lot of fun with kind of like trying to pick apart the, you know, motivations of the text and stuff. Sixty-three. A woman from Gond, now a widow was often seen with her husband on the star deck was often seen with her husband on the star with her husband on the star deck seen with her husband often seen with her husband on the star with her husband now a widow was often seen with her husband on the star deck with her husband on the star deck was often seen with her husband, with her husband on the star, with her husband, seen with her husband. Mm. I like this one better. So this is kind of a touching little non sequitur chapter. There's a few chapters. It's a cool book because it, the chapters are so short. And a lot of times they'll talk about the main story, but there's also like just kind of like little textural moments. Like this chapter is roughly two minutes long as you can see here and it's it's just about uh an old couple that used to sit on the star deck and and just they had their bags packed like ready to get off the ship as if they're as if the ship is ever gonna get to where it's going uh and they kind of like never gave gave up uh hope uh e even to the point that one of the two old uh couple died and the the other one still sits there like waiting for the day that they get off the ship 63. A woman from Gond, now a widow, was often seen with her husband on the star deck. For years they'd sit there with it's too long. husband on the star deck. For years they'd sit there with their bundles strapped, ready, as though expecting a landing. Though many looked at them with irony, which grew colder and colder as time went by, Audible really demands that you just crank the the volume levels on your thing. So you can see a lot of times it kind of looks like it's distorted and it is slightly distorted, but that's kind of, you can't, you can't pass the inspection on Audible unless you do that pretty much. So I got to swallow my uh, professional pride as a audio person in, in that regard. On the star deck for years, they'd sit there with their bundles strapped ready as though expecting a landing. Though many looked at them with irony, which grew colder and colder as time went by, which grew colder and colder as time went by, never many looked at them with irony, which grew colder. And... Though many looked at them with irony, which grew colder and colder as time went by, nevertheless, these two maintained a touching expectation, gazing serenely on towards the Lyra. 
Still in their fond minds lingered the scent of time fields they'd known, and of bread she'd once baked in the ovens they'd been forced to leave behind on Gond. They'd been forced to leave behind on Gond. How they'd been forced to leave behind on Gond. In the ovens they'd been forced to leave behind on Gond. How many thousand times these two had Gond. How many thousand times these two had studied Heaven's Prospectus, sitting close, absorbed, no mortal being here can tell. In space years which passed them by without a trace, until they both grew gray at last, and she was left sitting there alone in quiet recollection of bygone days, when they had lived together, safe in God, till the game of Jacob's Ladder. Till the game of safe in God. At last, and she was left sitting there alone in quiet recollection of bygone days, when they had lived together, safe in God, till the game of Jacob's Ladder was suddenly proclaimed by wailing sirens, and forced their headlong flight through Doris Plains. Huddled close together on Goldun's flight through Doris Plains. Huddled close together on Goldun's airfield, they took sad farewell of Doris Valleys, and with a parting prayer they laid their emigration problems in fate's hand. I used to know problems in fate's hand. I used to notice how for several years the widow sat alone there, quiet and bowed, while we with while we for several years the widow sat alone there quiet and bowed, while we, who with ingenious leadership endeavor to guide fate's hand, while we, who with ingenious leadership endeavor to guide fate's hand, began to despair of reaching the promised land, began to despair of reaching the promised land, bear of reaching the promised land, reaching the promised land. Good. All right. So now uh, I think we have gotten to the end of this. Yeah. These are like the batches in which I recorded the audio. Sometimes because it's across different days and sometimes because uh, I just didn't want to have too long of an audio file in case the thing crashed or whatever. So let's move to the next file. Uh, let's see. 63. So this should be chapters 64 through 89. So it's a pretty big one. Let's go in here. And I want to go to number 829. Uh, So now we want to treat this audio, identify where the chapters begin. Basically, I just throw it in these markers so that I'll be able to get to it more easily. Let's get rid of that one. And I'll take a minute to hit the effects on here. Jen Jen's saying, hi, Nick. Oh my gosh, yay, new audio book. Welcome, Jen Jen. Yeah, we're um, working on another one. This is another one that I am self-publishing and to some extent illustrating. I don't I don't know the full what it's going to be in that regard yet uh, and making an audiobook of yet. So um, this one is a science fiction story from the 1950s that was uh, published in Sweden and the American or the English uh, translations, all English tr translations of it are out of print. And so I, I took, um, you know, my favorite translation and, you know, a am making, uh, publishing it. Swarm in a to live where there's no, so while you desire, patient which spread abroad, sent
That's pretty loud. I can't bear to live. You don't want to raise this too much then. Damn. To live where there is neither joy crumble away and darkened. If I can endure, be patient, in which Hanyara was not. Maybe we can kind of hit some of these various spots with... It's sort of dangerous to do this. Burst and welled out, shrieking ghosts. The problem is when a character has, like, impassioned dialogue. Sentence is her. As you can see, it ends up being a lot louder, even with the equalizer. Ian, the tools of power which held everything in a cast iron and then boils up and heard the cry of Okay, so this would be... Huge rocks and thousands were injured in other ways. With the curving forces. God and Satan, hand in hand, from a defiled and poisonous. One by one, the incised features of lions and priests. By Lepra. Lexi swings round. So we're just hitting this with a first pass of general audio. Yeah, enhancements more than another. we hit it with a bunch of i have it like some effects racks that i throw on that you don't really see what they are because i i just have shortcuts that you know activate them but there's maybe like five different effects for like equalization and removing noise and all that stuff and th then i have this which is just uh you know it'll uh normalize the audio so i can like raise the gain and it it won't be as distorted uh, if it hits past the uh, limit here, we're we're trying to keep it a little a little bit under uh, minus three dB. Jen is saying I'm listening to Yesterday's Gone at the moment, but Post America is next on the list. Oh, nice! Wow, I uh, I'm excited to hear what you think. It's a it's a challenging text, but I I found it you know in in studying it Time to will... make it, and also when I was originally reading it, like I just found it to be really rewarding. Uh. Yeah, that's what made me so passionate about the project. Yeah, I'm interested to hear what, what you think. Yesterday's Gone, uh, what is that one about? I, I doubt that it's about this, but there's an excellent uh, 1960s song by Chad and Jeremy called Yesterday's Gone, which fingers crossed that it's about that, but I don't, I don't know. <laughs> is it Chad and Jeremy uh, biography? 64. 65. So this is where I go through and mark where the chapters are. 67. You missed one, apparently. 67. And this is, yeah, when I'm, is when I'm going 68. back through, uh, once it's time to cut each chapter, 69. we'll be able to actually identify like where they start. This is, I found this to be really useful uh, preparation step. 70. You can kind of tell. So I look. You can kind of tell where 71 chapters start because of the uh, shape of the the audio. 72. Which is kind of a crazy thing to like see sound and be able to read. You know, it's like Cypher in the Matrix where he can 73. like, he can visually see the code. Does my... Okay, good. And 74. Seventy-six. We missed one. Seventy-five. Seventy-seven. It's a post-apocalyptic sci-fi by Sean Platt and David Wright. Wow, that's a different. Seventy-eight. I wonder if they were influenced for the name by that song. <laughs> Seventy-seven. I am excited to read that one now. The antechamber. 79 80 they just did the like yearly yearly uh 
81. awards on um, Goodreads, which is that like audio or not audio book, uh, book, um, 82 sort of like platform or whatever. And, uh, I just added a bunch of books to my like to read list from that. 83. 82. 84. I think 84 was the last. 85. Oh no, 89 is the last one. This was a long session. 86. 86. Boredom. Boredom. 88. 89. Yeah, you, you could probably see the pattern of what I'm looking for there, where it's like before a bunch of large chunks, you can see that little tiny thing. And because the chapters are always just a number in this, you can, if that little short thing is always probably going to be the chapter name. Okay, so now let's go in here. We're going to grab this first chapter. Years Sinombra's ashes in the slaughter mask of ghost on the fifth day. Sue you with vision. It's another really interesting Aston and no and Octopedia. Uh interesting aspect of the story where um as people are like kind of left alone with their thoughts on this stranded ship, um the nuclear war aspect is a big part of the story, and the people who dropped the bomb on another culture uh start to like you know really have like uh mental uh torture over that fact and and uh you know can't some of them can't live with it and some of them six have to try and rationalize it however they can and it's really interesting here hear us 64. Hear us, Sinumbrians. They'd sit there with their bundles. Let's raise, not this, this. You really have to push the audio, like, past where you would expect. 64. To make it work on Audible. Hear us, Sinumbrians, who haunt you with memories. We who have passed on and know pursue you with visions. For several years, Sinombra's ashes floated gently down like snow. Each time you wake, we stumble forward, our blackened arms holding up your shame. Sinombra's pillar of ashes traveled across Rind. It reached the coast on the fifth day and came to Cape Atlantis on the seventh. But the survivors found no hope. No refuge even in the open sea, where jellyfish were seen to founder and octopi Even in the open sea, where jellyfish were seen to founder and octopedia rose dead from great depths, like flowers of dead Sinumbra's ashes floated. What is this? What do, why do I have an alarm? I don't know what that is. Like flower, like. Flower. So this is a moment. Um, this is like a sort of like out of body moment where like a. It's almost like a ghostly voice, or that's how I'm going for it at least. Like a haunting, uh, a moment where the 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 conscience of the you know. Uh, remembering the the culture that was decimated by this nuclear bomb and came to cape atlantis on the seventh but the survivors found no hope no refuge even in the open sea where jellyfish were seen to founder and octopus refuge even in the open sea where jellyfish yeah, were seen to founder and octopedia rose dead from great depths like flowers of death Sinumbra's ashes floated across the waters. 
aquatic demons and angels swirled round together, all of them dead. Religion swam into men's thoughts, carried on the gulf, carried on the thoughts, carried on the gulf streams of death. The holy stone of wisdom, hidden in the slaughter mask of genius, was shot into the heart of the city of Sinumbra, which died for the third time. Oh, what a precious jewel was lost. Oh, oh, what a precious jewel was lost. the heart of the city of Sinumbra, which died for the third time. Oh, what a precious jewel was lost. There's some really incredible uh, uh, language in this story, um, descriptive language. Uh, for example, this part, which is describing the idea of, you know, the peak of uh, human ingenuity being a bomb that destroyed a culture is described as the holy stone of wisdom hidden in the slaughter mask of genius was shot into the heart of the city like that's a great <laughs> descriptor for like we dropped an, a nuclear bomb on them you know but that's that's literature for you ourselves and clearly the point at which it burst and Sixty-five. Sixty-five. We lowered a curtain of dreams, and between ourselves and memories of Sinumbra, a blessed forgetfulness filled with its own life spring, filled with its own life. Memories of Sinambra, a blessed forgetfulness filled with its own life spring. Thus, filled with its own forgetfulness filled with, with its fullness filled with its own life. A blessed forgetfulness filled with its own life sprang up. Thus, magnified, transformed, our senses soared in a new guise, bent on adventure among the dimensions. Senses soared in a new guise, bent on adventure among the dimensions, in a new guise, bent on adventure, bent on adventure among the soared in a new guise, soared in a new guise, bent on adventure among the dimensions, bent on adventure among the dimensions, bent on adventure, bent on adventure. A new guise, bent on adventure among the dimensions. An intolerable new adventure among the dimensions. An intolerable nucleus of pain dissolved. We felt quite clear. We felt quite clearly dissolved. We felt quite clear. An intolerable nucleus of pain dissolved. We felt quite clearly the point at which it burst and welled out, giving a nameless bliss in which Anyara was no more. Burst and welled out, giving a nameless bliss in which Anyara was no more, and Shafone had died. No one knew how or cared. And Shif a nameless bliss in which Anyara was no more, and Shafone had died. No one knew how or cared. No one knew how or cared. I like that more bitter one better. The phone had died. No one knew how or cared. 
Relief pervaded us all so easily. Isigel was there also. Libidel and the Libidinians, with the eight Dormophides, came gliding in. Isigel was there. Del and the Libidel was there also. Libidel. Isigel was. Relief pervaded us all so easily. Isigel was there also. Libidel and the Libidinians with the eight Dormophides. Mm. Libidel and the Libidinians with the eight Dormophides came gliding in, changed by the drug, as though by dew in mountain glens at break of day. By the drug. It's too loud. It came gliding in, changed by the drug, as though by dew in mountain glens at break of day. Break of day. Okay. Uh. Oh, yeah, so this is not. Do this, and then. This is a real short chapter, this next one. Upon us. Of the paradise I... Them is drink. Sinambra's shrieking ghosts. Yeah, so they're... Um, the people are, are so racked by this uh, incredible guilt for having destroyed this culture with an atom bomb that they are uh turning to you know self-medication and and stuff and some of them are uh not you know it doesn't turn out so well it's not you know they're trying to escape reality a lot of a lot of them okay uh so let's put this as a that and ladies and gents that'll do it for uh for this one so we worked through uh, roughly six chapters on this episode and uh you know we'll just keep pushing away at it keep an eye out for my edition of anyara soon to be released on amazon and on audible in audiobook form uh, and on amazon in in text form and yeah if you like what you heard in uh, of the narration if you want to hear more about the story, um, any of that stuff, uh, check it out. If you're watching these after having read the book, thank you for you know purchasing the book, and I hope you enjoy this behind-the-scenes look. Guys, I'll see you on the next one. Bye-bye.